This is the Saturn V rocket. It's what took humans to the moon six times. Do you know what kind of fuel it burned to achieve liftoff? No, it actually wasn't hydrogen. That first stage burned RP1, or kerosene, to get it off the ground. It's the second and third stages of the rocket that burned hydrogen, taking it from around 38 miles of altitude all the way up into outer space and to the moon. Now, I kind of like that analogy for hydrogen's role in the clean energy transition. Because in the clean energy liftoff story, hydrogen is not the first or the easiest thing that we do. If we can cheaply and reliably electrify a process, we should do that. In a world where our renewable resources mostly directly produce electrons, electrification is that first stage of the clean energy rocket we're all trying to launch together. But you can't get to outer space without a second stage, and you can't get to net zero in 2050 without some amount of clean hydrogen. The only question is, how much? Because hydrogen's pathway to liftoff runs through those hard to decarbonize industrial and heavy duty transport sectors. And unlocking those applications is not gonna be easy. But first, the good news, the clean hydrogen economy is poised for liftoff. In the wake of unprecedented public sector investment and tax incentives coming out of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the IRA, we're seeing incredible momentum in this sector in the form of accelerating project announcements and formation of hydrogen hubs that put us well on our way to hitting that goal of 10 megatons of clean hydrogen by 2030. But we can't stop there, because in order for hydrogen to truly lift off, we have to achieve scale, scale that goes beyond those immediate end uses in refining and ammonia production that the 45V production tax credit has already pulled forward and into the money. What we need is two things. Uh, we need an expansion of the midstream infrastructure, how we transport, distribute, and store hydrogen. And we need to unlock those high value distributed end uses of hydrogen in industrials and heavy duty transport. So how do we do that? Well, let's talk about the midstream first. Midstream costs can be an expensive deal breaker. Right now and in the short run, hydrogen producers and end users are either co-located or they're connected via private pipelines. And if you want to go any further beyond that, you have to truck it around very expensively. If you're planning to liquefy and truck your hydrogen, that could add well over $3 a kilogram to your levelized cost of hydrogen, as compared with 20 to 50 cents if you're able to pipe it. So even as those production costs for clean hydrogen come down toward that dollar per kilogram target, those midstream and downstream costs could double, triple, even quadruple the final delivered cost of hydrogen. And that will put a lot of those end use applications out of reach. So what do we do? Well, we have to get those cheap electrons in the wind corridor and transform them into affordable fuel at refueling stations for cross-country trucking. And we've got to get that cheap blue hydrogen in the natural gas-rich regions of the US into chemicals and steel production facilities. And we've got to connect both supply and demand to cheap salt cavern storage. Now, as a country, we've actually figured out this kind of thing before. We've not only sent people to the moon, we've also built a nationwide infrastructure network for natural gas. The US is actually incredibly good at moving around molecules, and we have a great foundation to build on. 
So we start by building that connective tissue and regional hydrogen hubs, and then expand to the major transportation corridors from California to Texas, through the Midwest, up the East Coast. And we make sure that the critically located pipelines and storage are open access and that they're sized to accommodate more than just the immediate needs of a single producer and a single customer, so that we allow for entry of new producers and new end users to form a vibrant market. And we'll build it all the faster if we're able to leverage legacy infrastructure and existing rights of way. Now, building that midstream infrastructure is the bridge that will help us unlock that second piece, those high value end uses for clean hydrogen, including those transport end uses that I'm particularly interested in seeing take off. Now later today, you're gonna to hear a lot more about decarbonizing chemicals and steel and cement, and that's super important, and hydrogen can play an important role there. But transportation offers an opportunity for clean hydrogen to decarbonize everything from heavy-duty trucks to bus fleets, from maritime shipping and port equipment to aviation fuels. And it's also the sector with the highest willingness to pay, potentially up to $5 a kilogram of hydrogen. In 2050, transport could represent two to three times the market opportunity in heating, power, and industrials combined. A whopping $100 billion opportunity. This sector is the unlock that could take hydrogen from important but limited to ubiquitous. And we are seeing some momentum in this area. Um, after trying out some electric buses and struggling a little bit with the operations, we're seeing some municipalities reconsider hydrogen buses as core to their future decarbonization strategy. We're seeing big shipping companies announce orders of container ships that will run on clean hydrogen derivatives like green methanol and ammonia. And we're even seeing some early signs of pure hydrogen-powered flight become a reality. Now, you might have missed this, but just earlier this spring, we saw the maiden voyage of a fuel cell-powered Dash 8 regional jet. And as an MIT engineer and an avid reader of the tech review, I have to share with you that this year, hydrogen planes made it on the list as the fan favorite on the tech review's top 10 breakthrough technologies of the year. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> but I know that there may still be some doubters among us, despite all that. But I hope we all recognize that the potential is there. And what excites me the most about hydrogen's potential is that it stretches across our entire economy. So I want to leave you with this. This hydrogen rocket is taking off. And the seats don't have to be limited to a couple of industrial gas companies and their legacy customers. There's a seat for the automotive OEM looking to build the heavy duty vehicle of the future. There's a seat for the utility looking to try out blending or long duration storage. There's a seat for the community organizer pushing to clean up that long operating refinery. And there's a seat for the entrepreneur willing to overcome all odds to make a new application take flight. But make no mistake, this is not space tourism, and I'm not asking you to sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight. Because how high this rocket will go depends on you. So we need each of you to find that seat from which you can lead and help propel this hydrogen economy to lift off. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>